It feels really good to be back in Northern Ireland. Beyond its obvious beauty and the amazing people you'll meet here, this is a country that has always given me an invaluable perspective on some of the more important things in life, particularly the freedoms that we as Americans often take for granted. Beginning in the late 1960s, Northern Ireland was subject to what is historically referred to as the Troubles. The Troubles represented a fairly complex divide among Northern Ireland residents. The underlying issue was the disputed status of Northern Ireland as a part of the United Kingdom. Throughout the late 60s and early 70s, an increased amount of British troops entered the country and began militarizing everyday neighborhoods. Many residents, often referred to as nationalists or republicans, strongly opposed the occupation, believing Northern Ireland should remain independent. And as British soldiers began playing a role in their everyday lives, these citizens felt their civil rights were being violated. There were, however, many residents in Northern Ireland who welcomed the British presence. Unionists, also called loyalists, felt Northern Ireland would be more prosperous as part of the United Kingdom. Adding an additional layer to this heated conflict was an underlying religious divide, as the majority of Unionists were of Protestant faith, while almost all of the Nationalists who opposed the British occupation were of Roman Catholic descent. It's a complicated mix. Politics, religion, and of course, money. All the necessary ingredients were present to spark a war that would divide a country and turn neighbors against each other, perhaps by design. Protests mounted, tempers flared, and violence became inevitable. As the conflict escalated, many nationalists took arms, and the result was the reassembling of the now infamous IRA, or Irish Republican Army. The IRA was a relatively untrained, poorly equipped, discreet army of hundreds that was able to push back a very heavily armed, extremely powerful British army of thousands. Violence became a way of life in Northern Ireland, and it lasted for decades. Only recently in 1998, with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, were nationalists and unionists able to come to the table and stop the killing. But as most will tell you around here, the wounds are not fully healed. In preparing for my journey to Northern Ireland, it occurred to me that there might be a lesson or two embedded in the troubles that could help us all better understand the American conflict in Iraq. Clearly, these are two very different wars, but there are also some glaring parallels. Most notably, our occupation of an unwilling country and the resulting human rights violations that have torn apart the lives of many Iraqi citizens. Perhaps there's also something to be learned from the IRA, a way for us to better understand how an army of so few could stand so strong against a military powerhouse. As we'll learn, when you're fighting for freedom, Anything is possible. Plenty of questions to be asked, and as important, a show to do in between in the capital city of Belfast. It hasn't been easy for the people of Northern Ireland over the last few decades, so regardless of which side of this conflict they may find themselves on, chances are they're more than deserving of a little entertainment. I just hope I can oblige. time I ever did a show in Belfast was early 1992, February, I believe it was, and uh, I was out here uh, with the band, and we played at the Ulster Hall, I believe, some of the most intense security people I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> mean. And, you know, it's us, the youth, they're out there having a good time, and they're very vigorous, you know, it's an intense crowd here, and these big, you know, big tough guys are drag them over the barricade. And I saw one guy, he's a real tough guy, he would take his two fingers, stick them in the kid's mouth, and yoke the kid up. 
by his mouth. And the kid goes into total submission. And the kid's like, oh. the kid goes totally flat. It's like, oh, okay, okay, I'm being submissive. The guy's like, oh yeah, watch this. <laughs> you see the kid like in pain. So I have to endure 45, 50 minutes, whatever the set was, of watching these kids get brutalized. The guy would yoke them up and then walk them down the barricade, making sure the kid's head hit the, the supports of the barricade. Ping, 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 ping. But he's an Irish kid. He's tough. He can take it. But um, that was my first time here. And it was a one intense border crossing going uh, from Ireland in, into Northern Ireland. Was, like all of a sudden, like, wow, there's nothing. And all of a sudden these people stand up, camouflage, trembling youth with some massively uh, amazing Teflon weapon that shoots for nine miles and weighs 40 grams. And like, they're just looking right at the bus driver. I'm like, we're cool, right? He's like, oh, no, don't worry. It's just how you cross in. They're fine. And that was my first time into Belfast. So um, I've been here for the last few days walking around. And uh, yesterday, Saturday, I walked around pretty much the whole day. And the hotel I'm staying in is kind of near the, well, a shopping center. I don't know if it's the shopping center, but it's a bunch of streets. There's the McDonald's. Uh, there's a Tesco. I'm sure you know the area. And so I just walked around all day, going into stores, just watching people do their thing in Belfast. And there's an interesting way you people comport yourselves when you're shopping for food. First off, people move, but they don't seem to move. They move, and they just kind of hover, where one woman with a cart can take up the entire aisle. Like, <laughs> how the fuck do you do it? She has the cart over here, her ass over here. <laughs> And you'll see people shop for nothing for like four minutes at a time. They just gaze. Digestive biscuits. My God, look at the potential. And I'm, I'm kind of on a mission. I'm going to acquire provisions for my hotel room. I'm going on food op. And I'm in like, okay, I know what I need. <laughs> and they move and I try and anticipate their moves. I'm like, trying to get around them, and they think I'm strange, I just think they're fucking slow. And so I was in the Tesco yesterday, and there's this amazing girl, little tiny girl, like four years of age, and she's slammed into the shopping cart, just in totally surrounded by groceries. She's got the front right side corner to herself. She's kind of like in this, in this tank of food, and she has a tiny stuffed gorilla, a little tiny gorilla. And she is having so much fun with the girl. Oh no, you don't, oh yes I do. <laughs> and she is completely engaged with the gorilla. I stopped and watched, she was fantastic. And the mom's like, stop that. I'm like, what do you mean stop that? You've taken her on this bullshit food acquisition mission. This is fucking hell for this kid. She slammed her, she's like, she's flying in economy inside this shopping cart. And she's making the best of it with this filthy little fucking gorilla. And you're trying to shut her down? This girl is trying to enhance her own imagination on this shitty Saturday afternoon that you're making her endure. Lady, and I want to tell her, I'm not it's trying to tell a woman what to do, but I want to go, shut the fuck up. Yo, you're ruining this child. She's having so much fucking fun. And I always think that parents shut down their children when they should let them kind of turn it up a notch. And so I walked all around yesterday. And why is it, right when I get hungry, right around 6 p.m., the entire shopping center, oh no, 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 we can't sell anything now. It's like these iron walls. And all these people start going home. And then the drunks come out. <laughs> And these people make this incredible amount of noise for no reason. They'll just walk down the street and all of a sudden this eruption. What the fuck? And like the people around me don't even go like, what the fuck is your problem? They're like, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> and uh, I guess Sunday gives a relative calm to Belfast. They, they hose the, the blood and, and the vomit off the streets and ah, ready for Monday. And there's hardly anyone on the street. You know, there's no traffic, you know, and it's very, very quiet. It's oddly quiet. And I'm walking down the street and I see two 13-year-old boys walking towards me, 13, 14, thereabouts. Each of them has a length of metal pipe in his hand. And I went, wow, I've seen the future. I see how I'm going to die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch my brains come out of my mouth before I die. This is really gonna hurt. And a lot of you guys in here, you're 20 something, 30 something, you take no shit. And if you saw two youths coming at you with lead pipes, you're laughing inside like, oh, you're gonna hit me with a lead pipe. 
<laughs> That's funny. Because I'm going to put you over my knee and give you the ass beating your alcoholic stepfather forgot to throw you this morning because he was too busy pounding your fucking mom. But you would not fear the two youths. Well, you youngsters will one day cross the 40-year-old threshold. And with that will come a bit of humor and hopefully some humility as gravity comes to take you away. Your perked breasts, your ball sacks will start to go down, down towards the grave. And you'll know what I know now. And you realize that any 17-year-old can kick your fucking ass to the giggling amusement of his hot girlfriend who will take sparkly pink cell phone cam shots of your twitching body as you spasmodically bleed out on the floor of a 7-Eleven. And so when I walk into that same kind of place and I go by the magazine rack and there's the young assassin looking at the rock mag when he lifts his eyes to look at me and says, what are you looking at, Mr. I'm like, me? I, uh, nothing. I mean, wait, no, you're not nothing. I mean, you're the man. I, I'm, I'm confused. I'm looking for the old man section, the senior section. I need some fiber, uh, some diapers, and a, a thing for that. I got a trick knee, hip. I was in a war. As a, I, look, it's your world. I'm just hobbling through it. So don't, uh, you don't worry about me. I'm just, a, but in my mind, I'm thinking, your father worshiped me like a fucking god, you little bastard. But that was the 80s. Those days were over. This is now. I'm 47, and I have to walk carefully. This is Eamon McCann, a nationalist from the city of Derry, and a legendary civil rights leader in Northern Ireland. Eamon always believed the problems in his country could be solved peacefully. That was until a fateful day on January 30th, 1972. This is the area where Bloody Sunday happened. Now that was an incident in January 1972 and we had a huge march. Suddenly we heard the sound of heavy vehicles revving up. Whoa, whoa. And they came in at speed ploughed through the crowd, and immediately paratroopers got out and just started shooting. And in the end, they shot 14, 14 people dead. Uh, 13 died on the spot, and one died later. And there were 13 people badly wounded. On that day, where were you? Well, I was at the bottom of the street when it started, right. so when the shooting started. And then, like everybody else, I mean, I tried to get away. So people were running, yeah. and then they were being pursued. Yeah. These are unarmed people. Unarmed people, absolutely. Now, from what I've read, the shooters didn't do any time? Oh, of course not. Okay. Nope. Nobody's been charged with anything. And, and was that uh, as if the shooting isn't bad enough? The fact that they were, people were singled out and stalked and pursued yep. unarmed, yep. and the, the doers did no time, was that basically a massive breaking point? That, that was a big breaking point. And then they compounded the offense of that by sending over a man called Lord Widgery. He was the Lord Chief Justice of England, the highest legal authority in the land. Right. He came and conducted this alleged public inquiry and reported, in effect, that they deserved it. You know, that they wouldn't have been killed had they not been there on illegal business, that they must have been showing some aggression towards the soldiers. You see, and that left the people of this area in a situation where we had seen, we weren't waiting for Lord Widgery to tell us the truth. We were waiting to see whether he would tell the truth. We knew the truth. We had right. seen it. I had seen people being killed just down here. I was lying in the gutter, literally lying in the gutter, just, I mean, at, at, at the corner here, and crawling and pulling myself along with my elbows, and looked back, and I saw three people being killed. So I didn't need an English judge to tell me right. what had happened. So, and you see, you've got to ask yourself a simple question. When the state forces come into an area and kill unarmed people, and then the highest legal authority in the land says that was an okay thing to do. How could anybody argue to the people of this area that they should seek a solution to their problems through constitutional means? Right. You know, through democracy. We had seen what had happened. That was the biggest single reason that young people in this area joined the IRA. They so, just said, fuck it. I mean, we're not going to get justice through the normal channels. We've just got to do it ourselves and fight back. That's what happened. Bloody Sunday was a call to arms for many nationalists, most of whom were young men with virtually no military training, driven by anger and loss. Many tried to stop them, hopeful for a peaceful resolution. But with 14 dead and more wounded, it seemed to most that the war had already begun. Anthony McIntyre, former member of the IRA. 
What is the IRA? Well, the IRA was a, an army of uh, volunteers, uh, and volunteers in the sense that they were unpaid, they were not coerced, they joined up, and they fought in, in a struggle against repression, and that repression was in the armory of the British state. Uh, the British state introduced a number of repressive measures in the early 1970s, uh, each successive year, 1970, 1971, 1972, and that role in any sense of history, any republican tradition, uh, drove people into the ranks of the IRA. When did you join the IRA and why? I joined the IRA back in the 1970s and I joined them uh, largely as a result of British state repression, military repression on the streets of the north. What were your responsibilities as a member of the IRA? Well, when I was a young member of the IRA, my responsibilities were operational. Uh, that would have involved shooting attacks in the British, uh, occasional bomb attack, hijacking, kidnapping, the whole range of activities that a girl, a volunteer in the IRA would get involved in. Uh, and later on in the IRA, I was more into intelligence. Uh, this is after I'd served time in prison. Uh, when I got out after 18 months in prison, I was a company commander, which meant I would have been directing all the activities within the IRA in South Belfast. Uh, and then after serving a bigger sentence, a uh, life sentence, I was in, uh, came out and at that stage I was more involved in uh, IRA intelligence killing. As far as people uh, being killed, was, was there a, a, a target list, a list of objectives? It was a target list in terms of uh, military targets, and sometimes that uh, broadened uh, over the years as uh, the prime targets were increasingly difficult to get. But we started out uh, wanting to shoot members of the police force, the RUC, members of the British Army, members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, uh, and occasionally in the early days we would have targeted people in Loyalist death squads. Uh, as time went on, uh, we expanded. Uh, our, our target list into attacking building contractors and at all times we would have uh, targeted informers, people who were assisting the police. Do you think the IRA should be characterized as a, a terrorist group or if not, what, what, how, they should, how should they be considered? There's always a problem of definition uh, in relation to uh, describing groups as terrorist. Uh, I mean, I believe that many of the governments throughout the world are terrorist. I think the IRA were an insurrection, a political insurrectionary movement that were not terrorists but did at times uh, engage in, in activities that would be regarded as terrorists. Now, people sometimes uh, engage in foolish acts but they cannot be dismissed or regarded or defined as fools. It's the amount of foolish acts that one engages in before one is called a fool. As a resistance fighter, when you look at the situation that America is in in Iraq, what do you think of it? Well, I, I very much resent the fact that America is in Iraq. Uh, I think the American government goes to a place like Iraq, uh, and if there's any justification for it going to uh, Iraq, it may have been to take out the fascist leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and leave it at that. But what they've tried to do now is impose their, their system on Iraq, and they've made, this, they've made the place actually worse. Uh, and, you know, I am not against the principle of uh, military intervention if military intervention can lead to an improvement in people's lives. And I think the Americans need to be criticised for not int having intervened in Rwanda in 1984 when they could have destroyed one uh, fascist radio station and that would have uh, stopped the coordination of the killings. But they didn't intervene in Rwanda because Rwanda was populated by blacks and had no oil. Now, Iraq's different and they have a strategic interest and been in Iraq, and so I'm very, very sceptical uh, uh, about the Americans in Iraq. And I, I have to say, I don't have a lot of sympathy with the so-called resistance there, because I think that the Carwin, uh, the, 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 the people who were involved in that, many of them are simply theocratic fascists who do not, uh, they have no liberationist impulse. They would as readily oppress women and repress people of different, the, different persuasions, and they would try to impose some sort of theocratic dictatorship. So I'm not in agreement with them, but I still feel that uh, from my IRA point of view, and having uh, been a long-term member of the IRA and served time in prison, that the American occupation of Iraq is morally wrong and politically indefensible, and will be to their detriment. Some say the IRA never had more than 300 members at one time, and yet they wreaked havoc on the British military. As an increasing number of British soldiers invaded the lives of Northern Ireland residents, 
more citizens found a cause to join the resistance. Kevin Ned Murphy, a Republican farmer from the heavily militarized region of South Armagh. We had uh, a military uh, movement in here. And um, then, of course, uh, it was resisted by the, the IRA here. Well, by the early 70s, of course, uh, the, the British military and generally British forces didn't go on the roads here because they were being uh, attacked, uh, landmines, so on. Then gradually, uh, of course, the, the bases were supplied by helicopter, first of all with one helicopter, and then uh, there were attempts to shoot down helicopters, so two helicopters came, one to guard the other, and eventually heavy machine guns were used to bring down helicopters. And um, the, the British Army had 14 watchtowers here, placed on the hills around uh, South Arma, uh, strategically placed. For example, uh, I just lived down the road here, I had three of these uh, towers looking into my front window. How did it feel to know that f there's a good chance that your comings and goings are being noted, times, locations? I mean, it, what, what does that make you feel like? Well, a prisoner? It, 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 you, you, you were a prisoner, of course, in, in your own countryside. And um, I just interviewed a woman recently in, in Fark Hill whose 15-year-old uh, daughter at the time uh, the soldiers met her on, on the street and they were able to tell her uh, what uh, time she went to bed, uh, what she wore going to bed and uh, what, uh, how she changed her clothes and how she looked. So she spent the rest of her youth with the curtains closed day and night. This is the kind of situation that, that you had. It was extremely intrusive, of and, course. And, and this is breeds resentment because there's some people who might say, well, I have nothing to hide. Look in my window all day. But that wears off. Like, just because I have nothing to hide doesn't mean you need to be looking. And so I'm sure that the British were able to turn <clears throat> perhaps the entire community against them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and you see, uh, the, the British had a, a, a bit of a disadvantage because um, unlike other occupations, they couldn't identify their enemies because they were all white. Uh, they all looked the same. And in f at least a 40-year history here of British occupation at these bases, uh, they've never been able to to really make any headway or, or break the people of Armagh uh, at all. And, and it, what's interesting to me is the British military have at their disposal every possible bit of bleeding edge technology, weaponry, whatever, going up against, uh, not don't be insulted by this, basically farmers and just working class people with no level of technology like what they have, like you can't surveil something. It, 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 what's the, what do you think that's like for them? It must be frustrating. Well, it, it, it was, you see, because the British military here, uh, that includes, uh, you know, uh, elements from the, 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 the Unionist population here who were uh, in the military machine. Right. Uh, they lost uh, 127 personnel in the South Amma area uh, during the Troubles, and the IRA in combat lost nine. When you see... Uh, America into Iraq, again, an army very formidable, uh, the American military with every possible gadget. The fact that they've been in Iraq for uh, five years now and they are being resisted every single day, they're being pushed. You living in a place that has been occupied and people push back, what, what do you think of all of that five years in? Uh, it's not possible. I mean, you cannot impose yourself on the will of the people. And it's interesting now when you talk about uh, some of the American politicians talk about this surge uh, is, is, is causing a more peaceful situation uh, in Iraq. Uh, you know, I know that this would be temporary. I mean, the British for many t times over the, the 30 years conflict here uh, said that the IRA were on the run, they were screaming like rats, they were being squeezed like toothpaste out of a tube, all this type of thing. Of course, it was nonsense because they are the people and, and you cannot, unless you uh, kill or intern all of the people, uh, you know, it's, it's an impossibility. If I were an American commander, uh, I would look at history a little bit closer. What was so unique about the Troubles was the proximity of the enemy. For nationalists, it was not only the British Army who posed a threat, but their supporting citizens on the ground. 
the troubles became a neighborhood struggle, shaking this country to its core. We are standing in the Short Strand neighborhood, uh, a Catholic neighborhood surrounded by a Protestant neighborhoods. And I noticed uh, high walls, fences, barbed wire, reminiscent of West Berlin when I was there in the 80s, before the wall came down. What's it like living here? Well, this is a small Republican community. There's 2,500 people live here, approximately. Uh, it's surrounded by a strong a Unionist Loyalist population of about 60,000, and we're surrounded by this huge population. As you can see, all the walls and fences completely seal us in, and at times we have literally been under siege in this community. You fucking bastards! When you say under siege, tell me about that. Well, there was very serious ratting here. There was petrol bombs, uh, gasoline bombs, as you would say, yeah. uh, stones, rocks, and there were shootings. There was five people shot, attacked in this community, five people from the Protestant community who were involved in attacking this community, who were shot by uh, Republicans. Every night, every day, people were sealed in their homes. The homes you see behind me here were, were boarded up. Mm. Uh, there was grills on the windows. People were virtually prisoners in their own homes. There would be people posted at all times looking uh, for the locals around here to, to throw things at. Yeah, 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 at all times. They were up in, up in the fences. They put flags along, loyalist unionist flags, and they'd be up in the fences. But uh, at one time, that fence there was lower, so it was easier, easier. to throw over. Yeah. But uh, they were using catapults to, to sling things over, and they were climbing up in the fence, so it, it was pretty bad. And so in their neighborhoods, in loyalist neighborhoods that, yeah. you're, that you're surrounded by, and you're, you're physically outnumbered, yeah. uh, has there been any nationalist groups from this neighborhood that have gone into that neighborhood for some payback or some kind of retribution no. or anything? No, it wasn't a case of, you know, well, they'll attack us and we'll attack them. That's not how it was. This community was involved in a struggle for survival. This community acted as a community, and not only in, in, in its defense, there was nothing offensive about it. It was purely defensive measures at all time. Right. But the short strand has been an area that throughout the conflict, because of its geographical location in East Belfast, has been very much to the fore in the conflict and has always had to defend itself. When I was very young, I'm 47 years of age, when I was a, a mere lad of 20, I left my uh, native home of Washington, D.C., and I went out into the world via rock and roll music. You know, I was in a band called Black Flag, and I left the house and went out and did some music. And as much uh, as I had seen uh, in, in Washington, D.C., which is a pretty intense town, it can be very, very intense there, very racially charged, and a pretty violent place. I saw a few things growing up, maybe a young person shouldn't see, but that's just life in a big city, what are you gonna do? And then I joined Black Flag, and I, I got America right in the teeth. And in the first 18 months of being out on the road with the band, I saw America, like this warts and all, right in my face. And it growed me up real fast. And over the years, I grew a certain amount of cynicism, where I realized I'd never be a good parent. I'd be good for a while, knowing what the job is. Like, yeah, I wouldn't duct tape the kid to a chair on the weekends. I'd let the, <laughs> let the kid go out and boogie-woogie somewhat. You know, and we get into Zeppelin IV and some good rock and roll. We'd have some fun. But finally, I, I would just break. And I'd have to sit the kid down and go, like, sit down. I just can't take this shit anymore. Dad, what the fuck is your problem? Just shut up and listen to what I'm going to say. I, I've been trying to be a good dad to you for all these years, and you're a great kid, but, uh, oh, fuck it, I just can't keep this information from you anymore. Kid, life is fucked, okay? Your mother's a bitch, I'm an asshole, and we're kind of like everyone else in the world, and soon, one day, you'll be a piece of shit, too, just like your dad, just like your mom, just like all your little fucking friends at school, and the bullshit teacher. It's all shit, kid. You know what? Fuck it. Let's just go get a gun and fucking shoot ourselves first. Like, fuck it. Dad, what's your fucking problem? I'm just telling you the fucking truth, kid. It all sucks. We're all just a bunch of fucking whores. <laughs> and so, parenthood is probably not in the plans for me. And so as years go on, I get more and more cynical, seeing more and more things, thinking that cynicism is some way of somehow keeping it real, seeing through the bullshit, like, hey, how are you? What do you really mean, how are you? You're coming out with how are you, but there's something going on underneath how are you. You're really trying to gain me for shit. No, I'm, I'm actually, I'm from Canada. And when we say, how are you, we kind of mean it. <laughs> That's what you do. And the more people I meet, 
uh, all around the world and in America too. And the more amazing stories I hear, the more and more it strips me of my cynicism, where I'm, I, I cannot be cynical anymore, or not as cynical, because I, I meet so many just amazing people who work so hard to get through their day, and the challenges they go through on a daily basis are amazing. And uh, I was in America doing a whole lot of shows recently, and uh, I, I, uh, I went into a Subway, where they make the sandwiches, the Subway restaurant, and I'm sure you know what those are, thanks to globalization. And uh, so it's an international language that we speak. And so I went in, and I don't like to eat food like that. To me, it's kind of selling out, but I was low on time. And I walked in, and I, I'm behind a man uh, who's getting a sandwich made. And I'm thinking, oh, I'll get that foot-long uh, tuna fish submarine sandwich. That might not be so bad. And I look behind the counter at the man, the, 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 the constructioneer who's making the sandwiches that day. Intense guy. He's got this big beard mustache thing going, multiple earrings, got intense hair. He's like a heavy looking guy. And he's got these amazing tattoos that go from the end of his t-shirt all the way down to his wrists. All black ink. No solid patterns. Those kind of see-through, semi-transparent graphics you see on the side of a rock van from the 70s or by people People who have basically uh, punched cops back, who've done time, who can go to any hardware store, buy a shopping cart worth of stuff and make their own crystal methamphetamine in the guest room. <laughs> Capably violent people. This guy had those kind of tattoos where you look at him and you realize he's cold. And I'm like, wow, he's gonna make my sandwich. Well, damn, okay. And so he finishes making the sandwich. And it's funny to hear this guy, this terrifying looking man, have sandwich talk with the, the customer in front of me. Well, what kind of bread would you like, sir? I'm like, is he really talking about bread? <laughs> it's like having a, a Nazi stormtrooper make you a banana split. Would you like it? Would you like a cherry on that? Like, did you really just ask me if I want a cherry on this thing? And so anyway, this very heavy man is like, well, you have five different kinds of bread, sir. And we have uh, all this kind of cheese, and you can make your choices. And so the guy finally makes a sandwich, shoots it down to the cashier, and he's right about to take my order when his cell phone rings, and it's on the counter next to him. And he picks up the cell phone. Hello? Really? You bring her here right now. <laughs> no, you just tell her. You, you just tell her to get in the fucking car. Yeah. No, you don't tell her where you're taking her. You don't tell her where you're going. You just get in the car and you bring her here. Oh, I'll be here. Yeah. Can I help you, sir? <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, um. <laughs> you're probably curious as to what that phone conversation was about. I am, yeah, because I'm, you know, curious. <clears throat> well, um, yeah, sure, if you don't, uh, that was my wife. Uh, our daughter is very disruptive in school. She got in a fight today. <clears throat> she got another fight on the school bus. And so I'm having uh, my wife bring her here to the store because I'm going to tell her uh, that I'm going to send her back to where she comes from. And I'm thinking, ah, a moment of light and levity, the daughter from hell. We can have some fun here. It's like, oh, the daughter from hell, eh? <laughs> trying to lighten the atmosphere in this sandwich place. This has gotten incredibly heavy in the last two minutes. He went, no, foster care. Uh, we, we had her with the state before, and uh, we tried to take her back into the home, but she cuts herself up, and she's disruptive, and she fights me, and she fights my wife, and I've just come to the conclusion that we can't handle her, so we're going to have to give her back to the state. And I hate to do it, but uh, that's what i got to do, so I'm having my wife bring her over here so I can tell her in person, and we can uh, take care of the paperwork and get this thing started. <clears throat> so, what kind of sandwich do you want? <laughs> like, oh, man. Uh, now we have to have bread talk. Well, let's see. The wheat berry looks very nice, but the pimento rye is also very alluring. And so we go through the sandwich, and I'm thinking the whole time, man, maybe I should go back there and make it, and you should go outside and take a break and think about this, this crazy thing you're going to have to do about your family right now. And so he, he just made the sandwich and just shoved it down to the cashier, and I said, good luck. He went, yeah, you have a good day, too. And he went right to the next customer. Can I help you, sir? And this guy is doing that. He is dealing with car payment, house payment, child payment. Uh, the wife and the kid want to eat every day, so there's responsibility. The, the roof over his head, he probably can't pay for. And, and so there's all of that, and he's doing all of this, which is like level 10 of some kind of video game where you're being chased by nine dragons. You're like, fuck, fuck. 
and that's every day for this guy. That's him just trying to get to sundown. And he's doing all of it on a subway salary. That would be unbelievably challenging, where you take all the money you have and you spread it out on the kitchen table. You go, okay, 85 bucks. It's Tuesday. I get paid on Monday. How the fuck do I make $85, feed this family, put gas in the car? Okay, I won't smoke. We'll drink water out of the sink. We, I'll, I'll get a ride with my buddy. I'll jog to work on those two days, and I'll get the public I'll thumb a ride home on those two days. That way we'll have oatmeal. And, and that's what a lot of people deal with all the time. This is just their day to day. And this is true all over the world. And this is the kind of thing that strips me of my cynicism because I can't hate a person like this. Well, they can do bad stuff, but I can't be judgmental and I can't be cynical because if you're cynical, you're just not listening. It's clear that there's always been a divide among Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. But it seems the violence, which would come to define this region, was escalated as a result of British military involvement. In looking at our situation in Iraq, one has to question whether an unwanted American presence has fueled the conflict among Sunnis and Shiites. And more importantly, what responsibility do we have as an occupying force to ensure peace among Iraqi citizens upon our withdrawal? Solutions won't be easy, but perhaps some can be found here in Northern Ireland, where many still pray that peace will be permanent. Eamon, how did, how did uh, Northern Ireland go from war to peace? And do you agree with, with the current peace agreement? I agree with the peace, but I don't agree with the agreement. Well, <laughs> can you right. expand on that? Well, my problem with the agreement is I always agreed with the peace. I thought, you know, and, and particularly in the last 10 years, the war, say, lasted 25 years. In the last 10 years, it was evident to any sensible person, this is going nowhere. It's commonly presented as if there were these clever leaders who led, you know, a warlike people onto the path of peace. That is not true at all. What actually happened is that the people demanded it, sort of, and the leaders got themselves into alignment with the, with the people were. It's an agreement which enables, or purports to enable, the, all the people of North Ireland, the Catholics and the Protestants, to live alongside one another, but not as yeah, one yeah, with one right. another. So, so it's not bringing people together. It's not bringing people it's together. It's compartmentalizing and just Absolutely. keeping them out of each other's faces. Absolutely. And we see echoes, at least I see echoes of that in the Balkans, you know, sort of in Iraq at the moment, where people talk, well, let's just divide the place up and yeah. of course, it's just it's a, 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 a and, and she is. You know, and that's not a recipe for long-term peace. No. I mean, that's because the abrasion at the it, interface it, it, is always going to spark at a, some it's, time. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a cosmetic. Yeah, cure. it's a cosmetic. And I don't approve of the shape of the agreement. I and I, I do think that there's... I, I think there's a hunger in Northern Ireland, and the Protestant community as well as the Catholic community, not only to get over the violence, but to get over the whole thing. Yeah. To get over the whole... As people know now, I mean, there's no... This is a, it's a nice-looking area, I think, yeah. but a very poor area. I mean, all the statistics show it's a very deprived area. I mean, high unemployment, high levels of all sorts of uh, illnesses, low incomes, very low incomes, uh, uh, people have. And there's no solution to poverty in this area which would not also be a solution to poverty in Protestant areas. So there, as simple as that, you've got the bases there for people to come, in, come together. Kill all SFRUC, and the SF stands for Sinn Féin, okay. Jerry Adams' party, and the RUC is the old police force. So there's somebody who's written up, kill all members of Sinn Féin and the RUC. That's an anti-peace process yeah. thing. Now, that's a very much a minority point of view, but it's a minority in the general population, but quite a lot of the young people of this area would sympathize with that because right. they're, they, they, as they say, they got nothing out of the peace process. They're still hanging around street corners. If they have got jobs at all, they're shit jobs with no prospects and all the rest of it. So why should they buy into a peace process right. which is giving them nothing? So they blame those who negotiated uh, the peace process. So you got that. And that's right, you said the peace mural. There's something unsatisfactory. People are vaguely dissatisfied with the peace as if. Now, we have to, we're being asked to settle back into ordinary life, sort of, and accept the ordinary day-to-day -day pinpricks of humiliation that people get in any class-divided society uh, and all the rest of it. And there are times when even very moderate, peace-loving people, you know, you think it, it's not enough. It's not enough. Yeah. Given the investment of pain and death, and pain inflicted and death inflicted as well as received and endured, you know, given all that for so long, 
you know, is this a big enough return on what was yeah. invested in the struggle? And it's hard to argue that it was. And I think maybe that the insipid, as I see it, the insipid nature of the peace mural perhaps sums up sort of that rather peel or, a, a or, result. Or perhaps to say, we've arrived, we're done. Yeah, it could, like, you yeah, know, like, yeah, here's yeah. peace and here's the wall. Like, yeah. stop moving yeah, forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. That yeah. sucks for me. And the, and the other thing is that I can't and, yeah, any sort of radicalism, any challenge to the system at all now, people say, don't threaten the peace. Don't threaten the peace. Even if it's a struggle about nothing to do, I mean, with the causes of the war. Right. They say, settle down, settle down. You know, sort of wait until the peace must be consolidated. But I don't believe we're out of this yet. I think that there's whole districts and whole areas still living with the trauma of the conflict and there's all sorts of unresolved issues and underlying issues that could all come to the surface quite quickly. Well, it, it's quite obvious you have your peace wall and you have the response to it right yes, there. Indeed. I that, mean, like, yeah. there's your frustration yeah. to all SFRUC members. I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's yeah. what, that's, I'm sure that's why the graffiti artist put that right there so you would... Oh, no question about it, no yeah. question about it. That is a comment, a commentary on that. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. The question is, which wall wins? Yeah, which wall wins. <laughs> As some locals debate the best strategy to ensure a peaceful future, others still grapple with the past. This is a generational war, and as tales of the troubles are passed down, so is the burden of loss or resentment. One can only speculate how many generations it will take before this struggle is fully resigned to history. Willie Frazier, Protestant Unionist from the county of Armagh. What was your life like as a Protestant during the Troubles? Hmm. Well, at the start of the Troubles, and I think that some people need to understand, Protestant Catholic get on OK. And still, even to this day, we get on OK. Like, I went to Catholic school, uh, I played Gaelic football, and even later on, when I was playing soccer, uh, half the team was Catholic, half of it was Protestant. There's no divides here, there's no walls. You know, we live next door to each other, we socialise with each other, but then, it's, whenever the troubles actually started, I was about 11 or 12, life became hell. You couldn't go out of your house because you were getting beat. Uh, the house was blew up five times, no warning bombs. The house was shot at, paddle bombed. Uh, you just automatically, you went from one situation where you were able to go out and play football with your neighbours to being attacked if you come out through your gate. So you actually, your home became your prison. You know, people say that oh, you have to move on and you must forget it, and you're holding up uh, the process here because you want to bring up the past. Well, the past is not the past for us. I can tell you exactly what I was doing the night my father was shot, the night my uncle was shot, uh, the morning my friend was kidnapped. I can remember his words. It's not just a symbol, as people think, to forget about what happened. Even in this square here where we're standing, you know, quite a few people have been killed. Show me, show me yeah. where. Two soldiers were coming from the post office, walking up there. I don't even think they were armed. And they were uh, taking over a building here, uh, the top floor, and they riddled them. And me and another fella were walking across along here. And we went over, the two boys were dead, but it was raining. And whenever the, the, the rest of the army come out, uh, they put us down around the corner just around that corner there. The, uh, as you can see, that's the piece. You know, the people tell you they're sorry, just about them Land Rovers going up there. Yeah. Wow. You see, j just to cut, just sorry to cut across that question. People tell us there's peace. You only have to see four armoured vehicles going up there. I guarantee you there's more. That's how they patrol here at the minute. They're still patrolling in armoured vehicles. Up to two years ago, they were flying them in, in helicopters. Not ten years ago, two years ago, they were flying in helicopters. It's only in the last two years they've been able to travel in armoured vehicles. While significantly reduced since the Troubles, there is still a lingering British military presence here. And for many, that serves as a reminder that independence has yet to be fully achieved. There's 5,000 British troops here. That, that's how many British troops are in Iraq. 
So we're still a country under occupation. And the British government are always trying to portray this as a sectarian conflict. Mm. This is not a sectarian conflict. The British army are occupying our country. And the, the ARA were trying to put the British out to get them to leave our country. So that has been the case. But the British have tried to portray it as Catholic against Protestants. Right, and it's not. Have, well, it, it, it comes into it, but the, the main focus for Republicans here was to get the British, the British government to declare that they're leaving Ireland and give the Irish people the right to self-determination, which we've never had. It's very easy to, to fall into the, the trap, as, as Frank says, about the, this agenda that this is not a sectarian conflict. Right. This is not what this is about. It's never been what it's been about. And all we ever wanted was not only the unification of our country, but equality and justice the basic human rights that everyone is entitled to in any democracy. And this is hope where we're hoping that we're at now. But even as you can see now, 10 years into the peace process, and it's the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, this area is still very heavily monitored by security cameras. These fences are getting bigger, not smaller. Okay, if you walk around this area, all those cameras are pointing inwards. They're not pointing outwards. We have a heavily fortified barracks still in this area, and there's no reason for it to be there anymore. It's not coming under attack. So this community, although we're living in, in a sense of peace, you know, we still feel that uh, at the end of the day, we're still, we, that siege mentality it still exists. Yeah. It may not exist sort of uh, in the sense that there's, there's hundreds of people around you, but look around this area. You can't walk in this area without being on camera, without being monitored. That's not a normal democracy. That is not a normal way for people to live in a peace process. In speaking to the people of Northern Ireland, one thing became abundantly clear. The Good Friday Agreement may have demanded peace, but it could not guarantee unity. The issues that divided a country then are still present now. Even the politicians agree. There's plenty of work to be done here, and the lessons they've learned may have much broader applications. Peace is more than just not killing one another or not shooting one another. Peace is about building human relationships. So if you take the opposite of that, conflict is about dehumanizing each other to the point of hatred. Um, building peace is rehumanizing one another to the point of where we can live together in mutual um, tolerance and respect. What is being done to break down those walls uh, uh, between uh, Catholic and, and Protestant and, and, and try and bring people together? In a society that has been driven by division, for the last 40 years to such an extent where we have walls separating Catholics and Protestants. We need parties that are going to promote a shared future. In Northern Ireland, when you're born, because of the conflict, you're born with a mental map in your head. So you know which areas are safe to go to and which areas aren't safe to go to, according to your religion. And people then self-segregate. Services then become segregated. So the cost of that division is enormous. That's not acceptable if we want, or we're trying to build a modern, tolerant, peaceful society. Ironically, if you live um, a, 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 at the side of a peace wall and you don't need, know your neighbours at the other side of the peace wall, um, you, you, the realisation that you get from coming together and speaking to the people on the other side of the wall is that your security and your comfort doesn't come from having the wall there. It comes from knowing the people on the other side of the wall because it's they that hold the better quality of life in their hands. And, and just bringing those people together and having them talk, having them rehumanise each other, seeing the human person there, seeing that they, they suffer the same pain, they, have, they, they suffer the same um, poverty levels, you know, they struggle to get food on the table, they struggle with their children's education, they struggle to find jobs. All those issues are exactly the same whether you're Catholic, Protestant, black or white. And it's, it's getting people together so that they realise that. That's what will build peace in Northern Ireland. But not enough of that's happening. I can remember going off to Cyprus. I can remember going off to uh, uh, Israel uh, and uh, went off to South Africa, uh, all to look at uh, how they were handling issues of conflict resolution. But no matter what the conflict, the one common factor will be that you do need to have dialogue in order to resolve difficulties. Uh, and the dialogue itself doesn't do it because it is only if the willpower is there on the part of those who are negotiating that they actually do want to have a deal and not simply don't want to be seen to be somebody who is standing in the way of a deal. Uh, if they genuinely do want a deal, and if you have that on both sides, you will get a resolution. 
Having been through what you've been through, uh, being uh, in a country that you feel is occupied, what would you say to Americans looking at the invasion and occupation of Iraq? Well, I think uh, more and more Americans will be confronted with the question, what exactly are we doing there? And how does that equate with the right of any people, including the Iraqi people, to self-determine their own future? And if the Iraqi people were given an absolute freedom, the opportunity to say, well, do we want to be invaded? Do we want to be occupied? Or do we believe that we have the genius and the ability within our own people? Uh, in a free and fair society to form our own government, then uh, you know I think unless the Americans can say, well, we can we can create that space, then there's no right to be in Iraq. Now there's a abiding suspicion that uh, that America had other interests other than the democratic entitlements of the people of Iraq for being there, and it happens to be my own view. Mm. Uh, and I think if there wasn't the oil deposits, then America would not be in Iraq. If you had any advice to lend to uh, to uh, my government as far as uh, what it could do to improve the situation in Iraq, what would it be? Well, the American administration, the Clinton administration at the time, played a very positive role in the Irish peace process. There was no oil in Ireland. Mm. They had no selfish political interests or economic interests. And they did play the role of the honest broker. And I think that was a very powerful role in uh, ensuring that the peace process matured. You know, the ceasefires uh, that were established broke down on one occasion because the, uh, the political process was too slow kicking in. The, the promised all-party discussions and negotiations were not brought forward quickly enough. The American administration played a powerful role in putting a focus on that and providing encouragement for people to uh, return to the negotiating table. And then while they were there, seriously engaging on the, uh, the causes, not the consequences, but the causes of conflict. So, you know, perhaps when they reflect on their own role in Ireland, they might consider that, uh, that an objective, independent third party involvement might help them to extricate themselves from Iraq. A lesson for America and, and other states, other allied forces going into Afghanistan, going into Iraq, going into anywhere, is if they want a long, protracted, drawn-out conflict that ends up um, being about sectarianism, like, like they did in Northern Ireland, go for it. Go for it. Keep doing what you're doing. If you want to resolve the issues, get the people together. Get the main protagonists together, including yourselves. Don't, you know, don't exclude yourselves from, from the problem. You're part of the problem. Get around the table with all the main protagonists and, you know, hammer it out, because it can be hammered out. If they care about their country and they want something better for their people, they'll do it. If they don't care about their country, if they don't want something better for their people, then they have to be excluded. Where I come from, freedom is just kind of backed up in your driveway and dumped onto your front porch, like you're, you're free. If you tell an American, like, can you wait for just a second? You're infringing upon my freedom. I'll fucking break your foot. And, and, and so other parts of the world, as you know, are hungry every day and they're thirsty every day and they have real, real catastrophic problems like intertribal conflicts that have the whole country in a state of siege more often than not. And there's lots of people who have their countries invaded and occupied by outside forces and they resist. In America, there seems to be a lack of critical thinking in year five of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. If you were to say something like, isn't this war unsustainable at 330 some million dollars a day with all these kids coming home with their faces blown off and their legs torn from their bodies, not to make any mention of all the Iraqis who get killed for no other reason than they're walking down the street, wrong time, wrong part of the day, don't you think we should be doing something else? 
You get called every name in the book. You hate America. No, I don't hate America. I just think the conversation needs to change. What would happen if some outside force invaded America? What would you do? I'd kick their fucking ass. Well, then what do you think of an Iranian person or an Iraqi person who doesn't want you in their country? Do you think they want to repel you too? You shut up, you hate America. I go, see, you're acting like you're in eighth grade because you know there's a bigger discussion to be had here. And I know that uh, some of you people have uh, felt a little invaded and occupied where you come from. And I'm becoming very well aware of uh, how much one would resist uh, what they feel is an unright uh, occupation or invasion. And so I'm, I'm learning more about the history of Northern Ireland. I find it fascinating. And uh, I must admit, I was not exactly ignorant of it, but as always, there's a lot to learn, and you can't uh, say anything until you know at least a little. So I'm trying to learn a lot about you people and uh, what you've been through in the last several uh, years of your life. So it's fascinating to me because I don't really understand uh, soldiers on my corner, but I'm, I'm trying to learn more. And what I've learned from going to other places like in South Africa, where you see that people are just getting the hang of freedom because of apartheid, freedom came very slowly to people. And I see people on both sides of the racial divide, white and black, the people I met there, again, stripping me of my cynicism. I met so many amazing humanitarian people who are working so hard for freedom, for the pursuit of it, for the maintenance of it. And so it's a, it's a humbling lesson to see people work 15 hours a day for the benefit of other people, like these doctors at these AIDS and HIV clinics I, I visited. And so the more I see the world, the more I see the importance of dignity. Uh, like you, you have to let people have respect. And if you don't give them respect, they freak the fuck out. If you don't acknowledge their culture and acknowledge their freedom and let them have that, you're going to have a lot of problems. And I think that's one of the main things that's happening in the world, besides the uneven distribution of food in the world. I think there's a problem with respect and dignity. And I, I think that when you besmirch that, you get nothing but problems. And for the last couple of days, uh, I've met members of uh, the IRA. I've been to different parts of, uh, of Ireland where uh, they still leave the bullet holes in the wall so you don't forget what happened. And it's, it's a hell of a lesson. So uh, as I go, I am always humbled and kind of made to be very quiet and uh, I listen a lot more than I talk these days. And so I just hope that all of you realize uh, how important your freedom is and how not, you know, that you shouldn't step on anybody else's to keep your own maintained. And I hope you pass that on to uh, your relatives, your kids or wherever you're going in your life. Uh, that's what I try and do in my country because uh, it seems to me somewhere along the line, uh, we've kind of forgotten a little bit of that. And so that's what I work towards. Towards. And I hope in your own way, you work towards that as well. Uh, again, it's been a really a wonderful time tripping out in this beautiful part of the world. I see why poets write poetry and some of the women here. I see why fights start. I see why blues records are made. And I uh, see why you people are so, uh, well, you're fucking amazing to me. Thanks for having me. Good night.